10. But this morning we're in James chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. And I was talking to Danielle, my wife, this week, and she was asking about what I was preaching about, and I told her verses 12 to 15, and it's just kind of a summary of, like, two things. Uh, one, James gives instruction about not swearing oaths, and then he talks about prayer. And Danielle asked, well, how are you going to preach for a whole sermon on just those two tiny things? So once I got into the preparation of it, I found that I could preach for about an hour on the one verse about oaths. <laughs> which I'm not going to do this morning, but... I will talk uh, actually for a uh, pretty good chunk of the time about just the first verse on oaths. And uh, one reason for that is that, you know, when we come to the Bible and we read, uh, some things we can read and they seem pretty plain. So specifically, James' instruction, don't swear oaths. I don't know if there's, like, if, if that sounds confusing to anybody. Uh, but I think for us, many times today, in different parts of life, we swear oaths. Right? right. Uh, another word for an oath is a vow. Right? We, yeah. we do vows. We swear oaths. You know, if you've had any uh, participation in the governmental or um, legal world, you know, we are asked to give testimony under oath. Um, but then we come back to so then that's one of those things where okay, it seems that the Bible's saying this one thing clearly, but then do we just simply disregard that? Right. Or I don't know if you ever thought about that before. Okay. So now as a teacher, well, so let me just give you a preview into the end. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be okay. That's what we're going to come to with the conclusion. Is that we can say things under oath and swear oaths. But as a teacher, uh, I find it very dangerous to be at a place where we, are, where we normally look at Scripture, read what it says, and just disregard it. That's a problem, right? So then now, this morning, because I'm going to come to the conclusion that looks like the opposite of what James is saying, so I want you to not just take away what I'm saying and say, oh, Pastor Steve said this, is what it actually means. But I want you to know why. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, uh, one of the worst arguments in, uh, that I've heard before is, you know, like, why do you believe this? Well, my pastor said that. I'm like, hmm, okay, you know, that's great your pastor said that. I don't think your pastor is, you know, like maliciously teaching you something that may be wrong, but sometimes we, we have errors. Yeah. Is that true? So then I find it very important to give a lot of background and give a lot of information, especially when we're going to come to the conclusion that looks like it's opposite of what the Bible's saying. All right? Yes. So that's, I'm going to take a little bit of time on that this morning. So as we get going, I think you'll probably maybe figure out what I'm going to say here. So as we've been going through James, uh, Pastor Eric wanted to uh, kind of give a, like a, a fresh reading of James, and so we've been going through the Living Bible. So that's what we're going to do this morning as we read uh, verses 12 through 15 in the Living Bible. So it says this, But most of all, dear brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned for it. Is anyone among you suffering? You should keep on praying about it. And those who have reason to be thankful should continually be singing praises to the Lord. Is anyone sick? He should call the elders of the church, and they should pray over him and pour a little oil upon him, calling on the Lord to heal him. And their prayer, if offered in faith, will heal him, for the Lord will make him well. And if his sickness is caused by some sin, the Lord will forgive him. That's 12 through 15. And I think we can go to the next slide. Here we go. I'll keep that one up there for a little bit. I've always wondered about this issue of swearing oaths. So it's always seemed pretty clear to me uh, that reading this passage, and so we, which we'll find and we'll be looking into it, uh, James uh, uses and uh, kind of uh, you know restates a lot of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so actually this, this instruction about oath swearing comes from Jesus in Matthew 3 through 5. Sorry, 5 through 7, that's the Sermon on the Mount. So I've always wondered about this instruction, specifically about swearing oaths. Uh, but as a student of the Bible, I have learned that sometimes our plain reading of something, which means coming to it and then reading it uh, just kind of on the surface, uh, may not be the same plain reading as Matthew or Jesus or James has intended. Right? Because my plain reading is from a perspective of Spokane in 2024. Right? That's, that's just where I am today, and that's how I view and interpret things. Uh, but as we know, 
the Bible was written many thousands of years ago in a different culture, uh, in a different country, in different languages. So maybe my plain reading of something is not the same as what it was meant to be intended. Uh, more specifically, uh, there's a group that came out of the Protestant Reformation called the Anabaptists. Uh, they were split out of the um, uh, Ulrich Zwingli and uh, John Calvin side. Uh, and they took, they, they read some things very literally in the Bible. And so specifically, they take that oath swearing uh, as meaning we can't swear any oaths or take any oaths or do anything uh, under oath, uh, which means we can't serve in any kind of political uh, or governmental office. So anything that requires an oath, you can't do that as a faithful, faithful follower of Christ. That's the Anabaptist tradition. So then as we look at this today, and I want to see, you know, are they right? Is, is my, my previous uh, plain reading of the scripture right? Or is there something maybe a little bit uh, a little bit deeper that Jesus was trying to communicate? So as we've seen in the last many weeks, like I said, Jesus, or, uh, James uses uh, Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And James here in verse 12, in verse 12, uh, and he summarizes Jesus' teaching on oath swearing, which is in Matthew 5, 37 through, uh, 33 through 37. So I'm just going to go ahead and read that, uh, because if James is quoting somebody before, I think it's good to go back and find out what that person was saying, right? To see the context and to see uh, you know, what was being communicated. So let's go ahead and read Jesus' words here. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take any oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by earth, because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. This is before hair dye. But let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. I don't know if you've ever noticed or if you noticed as we were reading this, but Jesus was also quoting something else. Right? So James is quoting Jesus, and then Jesus is quoting something else. Which I think, as a good you know, steward of the Bible, and a good studier of the Bible, we're also going to have to go back and see what Jesus is talking about. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So Jesus summarized and loosely quoted a couple of Old Testament passages. So to understand Jesus' instruction about oaths, I think it's important to go back and see what Jesus is quoting. So as we read the words of Jesus quoted in the Old Testament, or sorry, the words of Jesus that Jesus quoted, uh, we need to be aware that oath and vow are used interchangeably in these verses. So the first two here, there should be on the slide behind me. So when you make a vow to the Lord your God, be prompt in fulfilling whatever you promised him. For the Lord your God demands that you promptly fulfill your vows or you will be guilty of sin. The next one is from Numbers 30. A man who makes a vow to the Lord or makes a pledge under oath must never break it. He must do exactly what he said he would do. we got two more up here on the next slide. Uh, this is from Leviticus 19. Do not bring shame on the name of the Lord your God by using it to swear falsely. I am the Lord. Okay, so at the, at the foundation or the root of these commands uh, is actually the third commandment. I'll read here from the New Living Translation. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if, is, if you misuse his name. Many of us may be familiar with the King James Version, which is, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Okay, that's what this is in just a slightly different translation. Do not misuse the name of the Lord. So misusing the name of the Lord... Um, you know, we, we, maybe I heard when I was younger, or uh, still common today, is you know we hear people swearing on movies or whatever, or swearing out in public, uh, and like you know using God's name as a curse word. We together. That's typically been the, the traditional uh, understanding, you know, our American understanding, of using the Lord's name as vain. That's not actually what it was. Should we use God's name as a curse word? No, of course not. But. Misusing the name of the Lord is really connected to this issue of oaths. So in the ancient world, perfect, thanks, in the ancient world, people would take an oath in the name of their gods or God. Uh, the purpose of that is, if I borrow money from Rick, 
And then um, to make the to make um, you know to make sure I'm going to repay that loan, I swear an oath in the name of my God. And then if I don't repay that oath, then my God is going to punish me in some way, right? You take a name, uh, an oath in the name of God, you know, by whatever Baal or whoever your God is. Uh, in the name of Baal, I'm going to repay this loan. And then if I don't repay the loan, Rick is going to expect Baal to punish me somehow. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's taking an oath in the name of your God. Uh, but within the Hebrew religion, God, our God, the God of the Bible, also instructed uh, the people to take oaths, or when they make oaths in the name of the Lord, make sure you fulfill it. Right? And then misusing the name of the Lord is taking an oath in the name of the Lord and not fulfilling it. Right? Like, like the God of heaven is not going to punish me. Like there's no repercussion if I use God's name in a wrong way. So if you invoke my name, this is, what, this is what God is saying in the verses we just read. If you invoke my name as security for a vow or an oath that is made, you better deliver because using God's name wrongly and dishonestly will dishonor God and ultimately end in judgment. Then God was saying, if you say you are my people and you bring my name into a vow, you better fulfill that vow. God is holy and honest and faithful. Therefore, God's people must be holy and honest and faithful. So we can be sure that God is serious about invoking his name in vows or oaths. So that's what the context was that Jesus was saying. He said, right, the ancestors were told before, if you make an oath in the name of God, uh, make sure you fulfill it. And then Jesus says, don't make an oath at all. So what about Jesus' other instructions? So God in the Old Testament tells people to honor oaths, and then God in the New Testament, which is the same God, right, just represented in Jesus now, God in the New Testament tells people not to swear oaths. So are we missing something? Yeah, maybe. Let's see what happens. Yeah, things did change. Jesus told his listeners not to take any oath in the name of heaven, or earth, or Jerusalem, or even by their heads. So it seems that between the Old Testament time and the first century, people got careless about oath-taking. Where originally oaths were used for serious commitments, they had been, become common daily occurrences. So the reason for the increase in oaths and the carelessness of oath-taking was the lack of general truth, truthfulness in communication. So it seems people's words were not able to be trusted. So oath-taking was added to the hope that people would be forced into being truthful with their communication. <clears throat> but it seems that even oath-taking became casual and people didn't respect oaths as they used to. Where originally people were swearing in the name of the highest authority, which is the God of heaven, people began swearing oaths in the name of lesser things, like Jesus says, don't swear oaths in, by, the, by heaven or Jerusalem or by the hair of your head. So the point of oath swearing was that the God being named in the oath would keep the person accountable. But swearing in things other than God indicates that there were second class oaths. This is what uh, Douglas Moo in his commentary on uh, James talks about, or actually in his commentary on Matthew talks about. And there was first class oaths that we swear in the name of the highest God, and then there is a second class oath that we just kind of voluntarily give out, mainly because we're not truthful people. Right? People know you're not going to tell the truth, and so that's where we, we get the pinky promise, right? That's where we get, I swear, you know, like, uh, um, you know, I swear I'm going to do this. Cross my heart, hope to die, right? Yeah. Stick a needle in my eye if I don't, <laughs> if I don't fulfill this vow. <laughs> but Jesus pushes the whole area of oath taking to, uh, to the side and tells his people, who are the people of God, they don't need to take oaths because they are always meant to be honest. Yeah. Every time they speak. God's people must not say one thing and then do another. They are honest and always communicate truthfully. Our God speaks truth and honors what is said. Right? God does not break God's oaths. So we read about it in the book of Hebrews. 
where it talks about God swore on oath to Abraham about his descendants. And because God was the highest, God didn't have to swear in any other name because God, right, who are you going to swear in okay. something higher than God? So God promised on his own behalf that the oath was going to be fulfilled. And that's one of the main messages in Hebrews, is that it was fulfilled and God is trustworthy. Our God speaks truth and honors what is said. Therefore, since we are the children of the Father in heaven, we also need to communicate truthfully and honest in what we say. I talked about this many weeks back, I think when we were in John, is when uh, Jesus was criticizing the Jews uh, because they did not represent their heavenly father. It wasn't like they were children of the father in heaven, but they were like children of the devil by what they did. Because when you are a children, a child of someone, right, in the biblical, uh, biblical explanation here, you do what the father does. And because our father is the heavenly father, we need to do what God does and look like God and what we say and do. As disciples of Christ, because we follow the truth, Right? Jesus says in John that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because we follow the truth, we must be truthful. We do not need to take oaths, make pinky promises, or swear, or whatever we can do uh, to assure people that we're actually going to be honest when we say something. So Douglas Moo in his commentary on uh, Matthew says this. He says, Jesus in Matthew is saying the same thing as James. Right? This is where we started in James chapter 12. He said they're both saying the same thing. Our truthfulness should be so consistent and dependable that we need no oath to support it. Yeah. A simple yes or no should suffice. Our mere word should be utterly trustworthy, as utterly trustworthy as a signed document. Legally correct and complete. So if we are expected to be completely honest in all our communication, what about official oaths? What about oaths in governmental or legal settings? Does Jesus prohibit us from saying oaths when we are asked? Right, this, is what we're, this is what we're talking about a little bit ago, is voluntary oaths. Right? I'm not a truthful person, and so I swear an oath to you that I'm actually going to tell the truth this time. Right? But what about when people ask us of oaths? So when Jesus was on trial before the high priest, before his uh, execution, he's asked to give his testimony under oath. This is in Matthew 26, 63 through 34. I don't think I have this up on the board anyway. Uh, so Jesus is asked by the high priest. It says, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. What does Jesus reply? You have said it. Right? He confirms under oath. Did Jesus say, no, I already told people you can't swear under oath, so I'm not going to answer you. He just, he just replies. The Apostle Paul also gave a couple of so help me God statements. Right, that's really common in our books today. You know, we, we say we're going to do something and finish with, so help me God. Yeah, that's a type of vow or a type of oath. So the Apostle Paul gave a couple of so help me God statements in his letters to assure believers that he was being truthful. So the purpose on his side was to assure readers with God as his witness that he was officially called as an apostle and that he was doing and saying what God had instructed him. Uh, two verses, I'm just going to read here uh, examples. 2 Corinthians 1.23 says, I call on God as a witness on my life, that it was to spare you that I did not come to court. And then the second one is Galatians 1.20. I declare in the sight of God, I am not lying when I write to you. So are Jesus and Paul disregarding Jesus' instructions about oaths? Uh, Douglas Moo again here in uh, Matthew, he, he gives a little more instruction about, uh, a little more context about oath taking, official oath taking. He says that it is questionable whether either Jesus or James intended to address the issue of official oaths, oaths that responsible authorities asked us to take. What both have in mind seem to be voluntary oaths, right? That's what we were talking about is that I know I'm not honest, you know I'm not honest, and so then I make an oath to help you believe that I'm honest. Okay, he says uh, a voluntary oath was most likely what they had in mind. But even with these, it's argued, the intention is not to forbid any oath, but only oath that would have the intention of avoiding absolute truthfulness. Right, that's the point of what Jesus is communicating, and then James is also picking up on. 
is that your yes should be yes, your no should be no, because you are children of the Father in heaven. Yes. God is truthful, therefore you should always be truthful. So is Jesus prohibiting all oaths? I don't think so. I did for a long time, though. But mainly because I read Jesus' instructions with my Steve perspective. Right? And it's just coming to the Bible without any kind of uh, research or any kind of study. I just read it with my own understanding. With all that said, I feel as a Christian, we can take oaths asked for us for an official service. While at the same time, knowing that we don't actually need the oath to keep us honest. Our yes is yes, and our no is no, with or without that oath. Okay, so that's our, our first point of application. Slide Then you can figure out what's going on there. Yeah, liar, liar. We must tell the truth, right? This is what Jesus and James are trying to communicate. We must tell the truth. We who are pe uh, we people who are followers of the truth, the truth, the way, and the life, we need to tell the truth. Christians need to be known as people who can be trusted. If we are asked to swear an oath uh, for an official purpose, go for it. The oath is not for our benefit. It's not a reflection on our honesty. I think it's a reflection on the, the general culture that people are dishonest in general. Okay, so if you are asked as a believer to swear an oath, I think you can do that with a clear conscience. The official oath is not for the official oath is not for us, but it's for the benefit of others. We know that what we say is true. Maybe the oath will actually get us to a place where we have the opportunity to show that Christians are truthful in every area because we represent the truth. Okay, pretty easy one. We need to tell the truth. Thirteen through fifteen. Let's move on to that. This is the second part. So the first was taking notes, uh, and then the second is about prayer. So notice as we read these next few verses what James is trying to emphasize, which I already said is prayer. Uh, but we can see that by the repeated ver uh, repeated words. Let me just read again here, uh, James thirteen through fifteen. So is anyone among you suffering? You should keep on praying about it. And those who have reason to be thankful should continually be singing praises to the Lord. Is anyone sick? You should call for the elders of the church, and they should pray over him and pour a little oil upon him, calling on the Lord to heal him. And their prayer, if offered in faith, will heal him, for the Lord will make him well. And if his sickness was caused by some sin, the Lord will forgive him. Again, that's verses 13 through 15. So verse 13, James wants us to know the importance of prayer, right? That's the point of this last little chunk here. He uses the word prayer or pray in verse 13, verse 14, and 15. Sadly, these verses here, which I have experienced uh, over my 41 years, uh, these verses have become a battleground for the ideas that all sickness is connected to sin and that everything should be healed if we have enough faith. However, I believe those two beliefs to be misguided interpretations of James' words. If we get sidetracked with these discussions and debates, uh, we miss James' main point, which is prayer is powerful and it makes a difference. Right? Yeah. Prayer is powerful and it makes a difference. Now, verse 14, he says, pray over them and anoint them with oil. So it doesn't explicitly say lay your hands on them, but we but we uh, assume that praying for people, anointing with the oil, uh, has the, you know, it's, it's implying that we lay hands on them, right? How are you going to put oil on somebody if you don't touch them? All right, anointing with oil. Let me look at a couple things here, uh, just for some, a little better understanding before I pick out a couple points. Oil anointing. Well, that's how you get oil on somebody if you don't touch them. We don't do that here at Jacob's Well. I mean, we do a little bit of oil maybe touching somebody when we pray, but we don't actually pour the thing over the head. So in the Old Testament, oil was used to anoint and to consecrate rulers and priests. The oil was a symbol of God's spirit coming upon the person being anointed. There's a couple of stories, uh, like Exodus 30, which talks about the priest being anointed uh, for his, uh, his role as priest. First Samuel chapter 10, when the kings of uh, Israel were there, they were anointed with oil being poured on them. 
So we should have the same understanding regarding anointing oil that we use today uh, in our, our, common, or in our uh, world today. The anointing oil represents the presence, right? It represents, that's an important word there, it represents. It represents the presence and healing power of the Spirit coming upon the person being prayed for. So of corresponding to the stories in the Bible, anointing oil can be either plain olive oil or olive oil mixed with some kind of different herbs which gives it some kind of pleasing smell. The oil can be applied in large quantities or small quantities. It can be put on um, you know, hands and feet in a place where maybe we have some pain. Right? These are all some common practices today. Some have suggested that anointing oil contains healing properties and can be applied to a wound as medicine. Olive oil was commonly used to treat wounds in biblical times. You can think about the story of the Good Samaritan. And after he got beat up and then the Samaritan comes and takes him to the inn, he says he puts oil on his wounds. Okay, so there's a common understanding in biblical time that oil could be used uh, for treating wounds. However, uh, we must remember that medical science has come a long way in 2,000 years. Right? Patrick, do you pour oil on anybody if they have wounds? No? There you go. While oil works well as a symbol of the Spirit's power, it does not work well as a medicine. There are many modern medicines that work, work much better for treating wounds and curing infections. Also, the type of oil, or what it is mixed with, I don't think is important. There are churches and Christian businesses that convince people to buy their high-priced anointing oil with the promise that it contains some sort of healing power in the oil itself. We must remember that oil is merely a symbol of the Spirit, and it represents healing power. The oil itself does not possess the healing power. I was quite annoyed a few years back, well actually more than a few years back, when these were there were a number of uh, Christian bookstores here in Spokane. I went into one of the Christian bookstores and there was a little eyedropper of anointing oil, and it was about $20 for a thing like this big. You know, it had oil that came from, or uh, was, you know, oil was made from uh, olives that came from Jerusalem. You know, it had some frankincense and myrrh and all of these, you know, expensive things put in it. And it was labeled anointing oil, right? So it's not, you know, they weren't saying that, that you can't use other oil, but when you start selling things that are specifically for one purpose, then it kind of leads people to believe that other things are not as good. Alexander. Yeah. Yeah, we can use oil as a kind of like a medium to get those uh, roots or those you know natural things into the person, right, or onto the person. But just saying that um, you know the oil itself or the oil we buy from the Bible bookstore, um, it doesn't have a healing like a magical healing power. Powers, yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. Thank you for clarifying that, out there. Appreciate it. Um. So specifically for anointing oil, James does not say that there's any special concoction for healing, right? There's no, there's no special God power in it. He just mentions using oil as a symbol. So it's uh, nice smelling oil is not bad. Uh, if you want to anoint people with some expensive oil, that's great. Um, but just, just know that, that there's more expensive oils don't have more spiritual power or are, are not better than cooking oil from one go. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. When uh, we lived in Uganda, uh, I had to go down to the capital city, Kampala, many times for different processing of documents and just different things we had to do. And for some reason, I was usually going through downtown Kampala on a Sunday morning on the bus. And there was this really big, like, massive megachurch right on the main road. And every Sunday that I was there, I would see it had to be like 400 people in a line with water containers standing out on the road waiting to get into this church. I thought it was super weird, and then I asked somebody one time, I finally asked somebody about it. They said, well, you know, that church, uh, you can come and have your small amount of money, and you can buy holy water from them 
that you can take to uh, put on your business. You know, if you start a new business, you can pour this holy water on the business and it will help it to succeed. You know, if you have sick kids in the family, you can take this holy water and kind of throw it over your house and it will cause people to uh, be better and you won't be sick anymore. You know, this pastor, all they had was like a hose or like a, a sink and they just fill it up and the pastor like stands there and prays over it and now it becomes this holy magical water. There's a lot of deception in that. Right? We don't want to. We don't want to get to the place where we think that there's magical powers in water or in oil. Okay, but what we're talking about here, anointing somebody with oil, it's a it's a symbol or it represents the spirit of God. It is not the spirit of God. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. We're doing all right. Almost done. In um, the last verse, 15, it says, The prayer of faith will save the sick person. And then he goes on to say, If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Uh, so the last one for con uh, sorry, confessing sins. So prayer is not only about asking for healing, but it's about listening, also about listening for guidance about how to pray. So going off of our, uh, the biblical story, and specifically the Old Testament, uh, we can see that some sickness is caused by sin or, you know, some kind of divine judgment because of sin. But we must never think that all sickness, or even most sickness, is the result of sin. Jesus clearly discredits that view that all sickness or physical problems are caused by sin when he healed the blind man in John. Let me just read, uh, read that short encounter there. So his disciples asked Jesus, this is John 9, 2-3, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. No one did anything wrong to make the man blind. He was just blind. But because he was blind, God was glorified through the healing. There is scriptural support in both the Old Testament and New Testament for the view that some sickness is caused by sin. Two examples from the Old Testament, um, you know, the story of the exodus from Egypt, uh, and so the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, his stubbornness, his sin, caused the plagues to come on Egypt. Okay, there's also another example in Deuteronomy, where it talks about the disobedience of the law under the Old Covenant would lead to physical sickness. Okay, and also coming to the New Testament, there's a couple examples. Uh, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, 27-30, the Apostle Paul is talking about communion. He said, there are those of you in the community who um, mishandled or uh, uh, kind of sinned against the body of Christ, and so because of that, some of you became sick. Uh, and then also in James 5, 16, which is uh, one of the verses for next week, James talks about, he says this, confess your sins to each other and pray so that you may be healed. Okay, so James also connects some sin to some, some type of healing. Uh, sickness to sin and then healing for forgiveness. So what is a modern day example of sickness being the result of sin? I don't know if you've uh, noticed all of those syphilis signs around Spokane. There's like a, so many syphilis signs, right? Uh, Syphilis, for the most part, I think, you know, except for some very rare exceptions, you can only get syphilis if you're not following biblical guidelines for sexuality. Okay. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So that would be one example. I'm sure if we thought of more, we could think of more. Uh, but that's just my modern day, just very quick example of uh, sickness from sin. So from the passages referenced here, we can rightly conclude that some sickness is caused by sin, while other sickness is present for God to be glorified. But I, I personally believe that most sickness has no other cause apart from bacteria or viruses coming into contact with a person's body. Whatever the cause is, we can be sure that Jesus has the power to heal every sickness, every disease, and every physical problem. Because of that truth, James tells us to pray. That's our second point for this morning. Very simple. These are really simple ones today. What was the first one? Tell the truth, right? Tell the truth. Second point, we need to pray. 
So I know sometimes we feel like prayer is not really doing anything. But I want to remind you that that's not the case. When we pray, we are partnering with the Almighty God for the purpose of God's will being accomplished in this earth. Prayer is inviting the God of the universe to work in our situation and in our world. For whatever reason, God has designed this reality to where certain things God wants done will not be done unless we partner with God in prayer. Many of us believe prayer is ineffective because so many of our prayers are unanswered. So I would say this, if most of all of your prayers are unanswered, I would encourage you to evaluate your prayers to see if you're praying for the wrong things. We heard James say a couple weeks back that we do not receive what we pray for because we're asking with wrong motives. Jesus gave very little instruction about prayer. But one thing he told us to do was to pray for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So if you want to see an answer to prayer, start praying for God's will to be done. Point number three, right? Point number one, we need to be truthful. Point two, we need to pray. And then number three, don't lose faith. Okay, that's, the, that's one of the last verses uh, James says in our chunk here. Where is that? 15. Um, the prayer of faith will save the sick, the sick person. Okay, faith is important. James said a prayer offered in faith will heal a person. The prayer of faith is done with the belief that God is going to answer the request. The prayer of faith shows the confidence of the person praying as well as the person uh, expecting the miracle. While some say that only elders can pray the prayer of faith, Prayer, the, pray the prayer of faith. These verses in James do not uh, require readers to come to that conclusion. Uh, in verse 16, which we'll see next week, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective, which indicates that any believer who has been saved, sanctified, and spirit-filled should be able to pray the prayer of faith. Furthermore, the prayer of faith is not about removing all doubt from the minds of the people praying. The prayer of faith is about taking the step to ask God to heal the person in need. Praying in faith is acknowledging that God has the power to heal and having the expectation that God will heal. Very simply, if you don't have faith that God will heal, you're probably not going to ask God to heal. Is that simple enough? The writer of Hebrews says this, it's, uh, without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So do you believe God exists? Do you believe that God is good? Yes. So if your answer is yes, and if that yes causes you to act on that belief, then you have faith. So very simply, faith is belief and trust in God. So if you take the step to pray for the healing of someone, that demonstrates that you have faith. So the simple fact that you would ask God for healing indicates that you have at least a very small expectation, at least a very small expectation that God will heal. If a person believes that God does not heal, the person will not ask for healing. So what about uh, the ever common uh, prosperity preaching? Prosperity preaching or the health and wealth gospel? To say that God's plan for us is to be healthy, and all we have to do is have enough faith. Some prosperity preachers will say, God is required to heal you if you have enough faith. So in response to that claim, that God is required to heal, uh, Gordon Fee, one of my favorite writers, Gordon Fee says this, he has a, a very short, uh, it's not a book, he did a presentation of some uh, seminary a long time ago, and they, they did the transcript of it. It's about 60 pages. It's called The Disease of the Health and Wealth Gospel. Gordon Fee says this, The first sentence of a sound biblical theology may well be, God must do nothing. Okay? God must do nothing. God is free to be God. He is sovereign in all things and is simply not under our control. The second sentence of a sound biblical theology will be this, Although God must do nothing, 
in grace, he does all things. No healing has ever been deserved. It is always an expression of God's grace. What does that mean? God is not required to heal anyone, but out of grace and mercy, God chooses to heal some. We can't force or manipulate God into doing anything. And then lastly this morning, one of the most common questions that comes up in discussions of faith and healing is this. If a person praying has faith, and the person being prayed for has faith, why do so many people not receive healing? The answer is very simple. God decides who receives healing. It does not matter if a person's faith is small or great. Healing comes because of God's grace, not because of a person's quantity of faith. For reasons we do not know, God chooses to heal some and chooses not to heal others. We need to remember that complete healing, full healing, is not going to come until Christ returns. The Apostle Paul prayed many times, but did not receive healing for the thorn in his flesh. As discouraging as not receiving healing was, the Apostle Paul was able to find strength and encouragement in the Lord's words. Uh, this is what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. If we need healing, we should pray with the expectation that the Lord will act. But if the healing is not realized, right, that's what we're talking about here, continue to have faith. But if our healing is not realized, we can be comforted by the Lord's words to Paul because they are true for us today. Which is, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Amen? Amen. Tell the truth. Right? What was point number two? What? Pray. Pray. That's right. And the last one, don't lose faith. Yeah, Uh On telling the truth, it also goes to the greatest extent. Because when they were making the apostles, they went in and were paying the taxes. And the man and his wife chose to lie. It was revealed to Paul that they were lying. And they dropped yeah. it on the spot. And an iron since fire. I think you had her for that one. Yeah, it's a great example. Sin led to death. I think that's the, that's the ultimate yes. destination of sin, right? That's what the Bible talks about. Sin leads to death. Thank you for that reminder. Awesome. Well, let me pray, and then we'll be released on this very hot morning. Thank you all for not falling asleep and staying yes. around. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that we could look into your word. Lord, I ask that uh, as we go from here, that you would uh, continue to speak to us, Lord, uh, through the word that we read and the things we looked at. Uh, Holy Spirit, uh, put those things in our mind and in our hearts. Help us to continue to wrestle with those things. Help us to go back to your word, to uh, find issues that we have or things that we uh, maybe need clarity on. And we ask that you would uh, bless the rest of this day. Uh, Lord, give us safety in, uh, in this hot time. Lord, help those who don't have ways to be cool or bring, uh, bring comfort and peace to them. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We pray a blessing over everyone here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.